have to admit, I'm usually not very intimidated by a task, but this was a task that intimidated me for some of the same reasons that Amrita raised. I labored and agonized over this talk, and I told myself it's because, you know, it's the middle of the semester, and this is my last semester before I come up for tenure, so I don't quite feel as newly minted as um, I think Deborah remembers, sort of like the way your parents think of you always as a child. Um, I think my newly minting, my, my diploma has dried on the wall, let's put it that way. Um, the last semester before I come up for tenure in the fall. Um, but I think the more I, th I thought about it, it wasn't just the busyness that was the angst and trying to carve out time for this talk, but it was more because that as a black female scholar at a research institution, I often have little time or opportunity to discuss or to contemplate the process. There's so much emphasis on moving from one thing to the next um, that we don't celebrate, as Dr. Myers pointed out. We're in constant motion, and so the thought of stopping and looking back and wondering how I got over meant that this was gonna be a pretty vulnerable place. And I don't have to tell you that, for those of you who are emerging or young African-American women scholars, vulnerability is something we have a lot of and something that we're not looking forward to getting more of. And so this was a very difficult um, prospect. Also, it meant that I would have to revisit with an eye toward thinking back the things I, I might have gotten right, but also revisiting places where I've made some mistakes, opening up band-aids that are placed over some scars that are still healing. Um, and so I'm going to come in my vulnerability and just thank those of you that are here, particularly the scholars that have come before us. I wanted to, before I even got to my talk, to thank you all for the, the, the authors in um, telling histories. Um, for the scholars that have come before me, the, the women in this room who, I, it would not be possible for me to be a scholar today without the work and sacrifice and the doors that you often had to bulldoze through. Um, I don't think we honor our previous generations of scholars enough, and I just want to thank you all. Um, and it is for your legacy that I'm speaking and also thinking toward the legacy of those that will come behind us. So as I sat there to contemplate and sort of staring at a blank screen and wondering which way to go, I started thinking about the title of this panel, How I Got Over. And as a gospel music enthusiast, and, and gospel music is sort of the soundtrack of my career, <laughs> um, I was drawn, to, of course, to the familiar words that emerge from a song. And I'm sure many of you are familiar that the song started off as a Negro spiritual um, that was then reconceptualized by the gospel great Clara Ward in 1951, and then further popularized by people like Mahalia Jackson and Aretha Franklin. And I believe, it, it once I sort of thought about the song and its lyrics, that gave me a safe place in which to engage in some of the issues that I want to raise. And I believe that much can be gleaned from the lyrics and from the experiences surrounding its inspiration. And so I will use the song as a background to help me shed light on the struggles and challenges of emerging African-American women scholars who find ourselves often standing in the shadow of the ivory tower. The circumstances under which this song was born or reborn in the case of Clara Ward instruct us and those committed to our success, one, about the important role of sisterhood in our struggles to maintain sanity, two, the need to transform moments of vulnerability and intimidation into motivation. And three, encourage us to take seriously the essential project of demystifying the profession for those that come behind us. So the chorus of the song, of course, and it's way above my pay grade to sing, um, and my students, often when I teach about the blues and things like that, they, they expect me to sing, which I think says a lot about um, what they think of African-American scholars, and they're like, oh, you're not gonna sing? I would give them lyrics, and I told them, the University of Texas does not pay me enough to sing to them. Um, so the chorus of the song is, of course, how I got over, how I got over, my soul looks back and wonders how I got over. 
So I'm going to take you to the place where Clara Ward, where this song was birthed out of her. The historian in me wants to always contextualize in someone else's story, I guess, even as I tell my own. And didn't want to talk about the black beauticians today, so I got really interested in the story of these gospel women singers. So it's Children's Day, 1951, and Clara Ward, along with her mother Gertrude, her sister Willa, and two other members of the all-female Ward singers find themselves riding through rural Georgia on their way to sing at a church service in Atlanta. By this time, this, the group was well known throughout the black community and had witnessed much success with their melodic hum, harmonies. As the Ward's large Cadillac stopped at a service station, a white man sitting on a bench began to yell to the other men gathered in the town center to, quote, come on out here and look at what he and the other men called their large, roomy, pretty car. According to Clara's sister, Willa Ward Royster, the men began to yell racial epithets, um, questioning not only what they perceived to be the women's peculiar presence in a fancy car, but also their fancy clothing. Royster noted that one of the men berated their mother in particular, who had stepped outside of the car to stretch her legs for, quote, carrying a purse, just like a white woman. Did you steal it from your work? And then he hurled the most degrading and inextricably interwoven of racial and gender epithets, which I'm sure you understand, the nigger bitch word. As the men continued to escalate their insults and intimidations, Gertrude Ma Ward, as she was called, had what her daughter called a desperately brilliant inspiration. And sometimes we need these desperately brilliant inspirations. And what she proceeded to do was to act a little crazy. <laughs> and this is what her daughter says. She says, her face was contorted, eyes bulging, and tongue flicking like a serpent. She let out a shriek and yelled, oh, prince of darkness, come to the aid of your faithful servant. <laughs> Priestess and vengeance and pestilence smite these children who defy and berate thee me. She waved her arm at us like she did when she wanted us to join in a song at church. So we took the cue and started yelling at her. Lucifer, oh Lucifer, before they die, let these vipers writhe and crawl, etc. <laughs> then all the women proceeded to scream at the top of their lungs, and the men backed away. The women then got into the car, drove away, taking turns to glance at the road behind them. Willa Ward explained that afterwards, she and her traveling companions were encouraged to, quote, tuck the road incident into their mental forget file and proceed on with the business of enjoying Children's Day. Of all the women, Clara Ward was least content to simply forget. She reserved her most poignant reflection. While she never talked about the incident directly, they said, according to her sister, she reserved her most poignant reflection on this incident by rewriting and re-recording the song, How I Got Over, just a few weeks later. And Willard Ward notes that this song became Clara's rallying cry and on occasion, her salvation. So how do I, how this story when I read it just resonated so much with me as I'm preparing to come up for tenure in the fall and awaiting the publication of my book, hopefully by the end of this year. And like Clara Ward, think about some incidents and wonder and sit back and wonder how I got over. I arrived at graduate school here at Rutgers almost 13 years ago, which is so hard to believe, wondering how I got in, let alone over. <laughs> and while I am thankful that I have not been subjected to the violent intimidation that the Ward sisters encountered on their journey through Georgia, and I do not mean to demean or dismiss just how horrifying and, and fearful that must have been, I do believe there are parallels to what they experienced and what young black scholars in these bastions of the ivory tower, like classrooms and even academic journals, um, what we go through, what we're constantly reminded of, that we do not belong, um, that we are driving around, as it were, sometimes in fancy Cadillacs that it seems as though we did not earn or do not deserve to be in, um, that we are in some ways as unacceptable to them in, in the academy in certain circles as they were at this rural gas station. And I'll never forget the intimidations that I faced and continue to face, but I think I'm a little better at dealing with them. But I think about my first year of teaching at the University of Texas 
And I had a class of about 100 students. It was the Introduction to African American History course. And UT, football is religion there. And so they figured that it would be good to place all 19 of the football players in this particular class because after all, it's just a new professor teaching African American history. How difficult could this be? So these students proceed to do everything from chewing tobacco to um, in class. I've had over in my early years a student throw an attendance sheet in my face when I did not allow her to sign it late. Um, to students openly confronting me about my credentials and my place at that university. And you have to remember, I was, um, I was um, similar to, to Stephanie. I defended here one evening, flew back that, to Austin that night, started new faculty orientation the next day at 29 years old, um, and still just sort of confused and in a haze. Um, and what I realized is that I often did what the other women in the car did which is to put it into my forget file and try to just move on. Um, but then what I realized is that the compounded impact of intimidation upon intimidation and upon intimidation ultimately leads to a demise. And I will talk to, about that in a minute. And when I read it, and, and the part that you all were so animated about also, of, of how these women reacted to this intimidation and got a little crazy, um, I think perhaps, I'll just throw it out there, perhaps it's something we can try to do. Um, at least, maybe with our students, if not, if not for our with our colleagues, at least not until we get tenure. But unfortunately, all kidding aside, instead of many of us acting crazy as a result of these intimidation, what I have been so pained to see is that many of us truly go crazy in the process. We lose our minds while trying to pursue this life of the mind. And if it's one thing I tell black graduate students over and over again, and, and some of them in here can attest to this, is that the PhD, tenure, world renowned, none of it is worth it with the loss if we have to lose our sanity in the process. I tell them to choose their battles wisely and instruct that the battle for our emotional health and well-being is one that is worth fighting. I'm sure that each of us in this room can painfully think about one, perhaps even more, um, than one woman, one sister scholar, one friend, one person we went to graduate school with, one former colleague, that we have seen the academy wear down, chew up, spit out, so much so that they're no longer mentally healthy, even sometimes physically healthy, and certainly no more productive. And I remember being a graduate student with my beloved friends up here, and we would have conversations about this. We would look, you know, as, as graduate students across and and see folks who were ahead of us and, and, and be confused as to what happens. Is there a point you hit in the profession where you just kind of lose your mind? Because we see some people not recovering well, and certainly um, many do, but we, we also would look and see many who did not um, do it well. And we would you know, swear to ourselves, this will never happen to us. No, this is part of our bond, is that if we see it happening in one of us, we're going to intervene and make it happen. We knew better than to sell our souls for the carrots dangled over our heads of doctorates and tenure. We wouldn't lose our mind in the process. We would never become like one of those women that we just whisper about at conferences like these. And, <laughs> and well, maybe just me. Um, and, after, and for a while, I thought I had it under control. I thought, I, I was like, I've got this academy thing figured out. I mean, I'd heard these stories and how difficult it was, but I thought I, I, thought I was doing pretty well. I, I, I landed a great job right out of graduate school. I, I had a dissertation that was well received. I got a book contract my first year, got a grant fellowship my third year to write. Everything was going smoothly. And then at about year three, the middle of year three, and I, I tell folks that this is the point at which I felt as though I got another job. Um, that it was a, cu a couple of years of being protected from service commitments, a couple of years of just figuring out the profession and you know, getting the teaching under my belt and all those things. And around year three is when I feel like I got another job added to the many I already had. Um, increased service commitments. Um, some self-imposed, some department-imposed, some otherwise-imposed. Um, trying to keep up with those, trying to keep up with teaching, trying to finish up the book manuscript, finally um, understanding the ugliness of campus politics and the cutthroatness. I think 
the first couple of years, I either just was naive or tried to stay out of it. But by year three, I started seeing things that began to weigh on me as a scholar. Not to mention some major life transitions I was going through and some health concerns, all colliding on me at once. And I began reacting in ways that I never imagined that I would. And in all honesty, I did not like the woman that I was becoming. Um, I was someone who stopped for a season engaging with friends and loved ones. As, and I'm one who was always so connected to my family and friends. I would stop answering phone calls and returning emails, and they could probably attest to that. I would go for just these moments where I would just kind of drop off the face of the earth, as it will, as it were, which is easy to do as a historian sometimes. Um, stopped working out, stopped eating right. Um, saw my students as petty annoyances. I mean, they really, and sometimes they are, don't get me wrong. Um, but really, just began, the teaching just seemed like such a chore and an annoyance. Um, for someone, and I enjoy teaching usually. Um, I became a person who only talked about, or should I say complained about work. A person who no longer found joy in serving my church or my local community or even my global community. Um, and I finally reached a point, and I, again, this part of this silence, putting it in the forget file, I was not articulating what I was going through. I was just absorbing these years of intimidation that had all come to a head as this new job, as I like to think of it, came about. But I knew enough in the midst of this anger, finally feeling so alone and so desperate and tired of staying silent, that I send this email out to, my sis, to a group of sister scholars, two of them who are here and some others who cannot be here today. And this is my email. This is really vulnerable to even share this part of it. But I said, I'm at my wit's end with this stupid book. It seems the more I do, the more that still remains. And then, of course, there's the problem of motivation. I got to the place this week where I was like, I don't even want to write this book anymore. Then, of course, the whole tenure process scares me, and all I can envision on the other side of it, if I ever make it, is more meetings and more committee work. Mm -hmm. My discontentment is spilling over into other aspects of my life. I pretty much cut myself off from the world. Um, I'm not being productive, and I just don't have the energy to interact with anyone anymore. Love, Tiffany. <laughs> um, <laughs> Make if I remember. I mean, I just didn't know what to do at that point. I had sort of built up so much, but I knew from our conversations when we were in graduate school that we said, if we ever felt it coming on, get, get to us. We're going to handle it. So I sent this email out. <laughs> and literally within an hour of sending it, I received phone calls and or emails from all the women I had sent it to. Those who had just finished the manuscript revision process gave me helpful tips on how to deal with my press. Others agreed to read what I had already done, no matter how pitiful or, or bad I thought it was. Others prayed with me and for me. They really, truly intervened and rallied around me. And so when I look back and wonder how I made it over, I can point to this moment with joy and rejoice that I was willing to share my frustration. I was willing to put the intimidate, pull the intimidations out of the forget file in an attempt to get the sister scholars to rally behind me. And so one of my biggest pieces of advice, and we've talked about it, I don't think it can be said enough. Keep a group of sister scholars around you who are not competing with you, but only want to see you succeed. Um, and that is key, and I think that was such the blessing of being at Rutgers. We had a uh, just a wonderful group of, of well, at one point, there were, what, five black women here at once? Mm -hmm. Graduate students, um, just wonderful women, and did not have that sense that we were competing. We really wanted to see each other do well and continue to, and you need them. You need to build those relationships. You need to be willing to be vulnerable within those relationships. You need to let these women check you if they see or hear something that does not line up with the woman they know you to be. So have the sisterhood inside the academy and also outside the academy to support you. The song and the, the birthing of the song is also instructive for newly emerging scholars in that Clara Ward did, she took that pain and frustration of that horrific experience on a rural road in, in Georgia and turned it into a powerful expression of art. While her mother and sisters were happy to have never mentioned the incident again, in the hands and mind of Ward, the fear, the vulnerability and intimidation was transformed into a praise song. Too often we allow this intimidation to stifle our scholarly production. And I will never forget, and some of you in the audience know this story too, how um, at a conference, um, an encounter shook, intimidated me and shook me to the core um, when myself as well as two other scholars, black female scholars, 
um, had a paper that was being commented on. And among the many things that this scholar um, ripped us apart for was for not providing sufficient evidence of racism in the Jim Crow South, um, which we didn't think we needed to really prove that. We thought that might have already been proven. Um, among other things, and that wasn't even the worst of them. But I'll never forget how that moment, I, I literally became paralyzed for months after. I shut down the conference circuit. I stopped letting people read my work. It was, I mean, it, it really was about a two-year process where every time I would think about presenting my work, that, that memory of that intimidation, this, this scholar directly trying to intimidate us was in my mind. And so I want to learn, like Clara Ward, in these moments of intimidation, to try to find that as a way to fuel my work and not to get silent and not to clamp down. Um, also, the fact that this song um, was initially sung as a Negro spiritual that was then adapted by Ward and then further popularized by Jackson, Mahalia Jackson and Aretha Franklin, to me speaks to the need for each of us as black women scholars, no matter if we just or it started our first semester of graduate school this month or if we're um, um, Professor Emeritus, that we need to think about how the song that we are writing, how the things that we are doing can be resung in subsequent generations. In other words, I think it's never too early to start thinking about a legacy. Every difficult moment should be viewed not only as, as an opportunity to learn for ourselves, but also to share these, this information with future generations. And what I've come to realize now, just a few months out from, well, actually, my tenure packet is going to be worked on next week. Y'all pray for me. Um, but <laughs> as I think back, I mean, I can't even think about that um, in so many ways. But I think so much of the anxiety in the academy stems from the fact that there seem to be a set of rules, but no, they're not written down anywhere. But there's, this, there's a map of rules somewhere in a crypt. I don't know where these rules are. <laughs> But these rules are never fully uncovered or articulated until you mess up on one of them. Yeah. And I think that just in this room alone, there are enough sister scholars who have been over these hurdles, who have a long view, who have come the way that so many of us are going, that we need to be really conscious and specific about sharing some of these unwritten rules. And I know it's a two-way street, and I know there are many of you in this room that are doing this masterfully. Um, but I think we all can do better in this. Um, that even if you're starting it as a graduate student, you know how to get into graduate school, which some people don't know. Um, you know how to pass a comp exam, how to write a dissertation. Um, you know what they're really asking for when you, they ask you to come for a job talk. You know, that's one of those things, you know, come for a job talk. What does that mean? You need someone to, to really sit down and unmask the unwritten rules of the academy so that a legacy can be left. Um, how to become, how to get tenure, what a tenure packet looks like. All of these things, I've started myself and I need to get better about it, but anytime I will go through an academic milestone, I will take just a few minutes to jot down five or 10 things that I learned along the way. Like for example, with this book process. Oh, you know, sometimes your editor may call you when you think your book is over and tell you you need a new title and you have nothing original to say about this book. Just these little moments so that it can be instructive and leave a legacy for those who are behind us. So finally, I wish to conclude in much of the same way that the song concludes, with a sense of hopefulness, but a hopefulness that is contextualized within struggle and perseverance. And the last stanza of the song says, coming from north, south, east, and west, on the way to a land of the rest, I'm going to join the heavenly choir, going to sing and never get tired. And I think this singing and never get tired certainly is not something that I think about to burden us as black women scholars because we are doing so much. But to not think about physically tired, but to not get tired of, to, of giving voice to African Americans' women's experiences through our presence in the academy, through our scholarship, we must continue in this. We must fight for this. We must continue to see that our work is valuable. And as difficult as it has been on the tenure track in some ways, um, there's, and even if I never get, if I don't get tenure in the fall, there's still a joy that should come from the fact that we've chosen this profession and that ultimately I am doing something that I love. A sense, I have a sense of honor that the work that I do is significant, even if it's not always validated. And a confidence in knowing that we not only have gotten, we have not only gotten over the hurdles that at one point seemed so insurmountable, but that together we can leave a legacy 
hopefully with our sisterhood and sanity intact. Thank you.